Year after year, the World Schools Debating Championship gathers the best debaters from around the globe. This year's pandemic made that impossible, so we took it online. In this style of debate, there are two teams, the proposition team, which is in favor of the motion, and the opposition team, which is against it. Each side features three speakers giving four speeches. The first two speakers generally present constructive argumentation. The third primarily focuses on refutation, while the reply speaker summarizes the debate. For the prepared rounds, teams research the motions for weeks in advance. For the impromptu rounds, teams have only one hour to prepare after being told the motion. He is just waiting to be let back into the Zoom call, so we shouldn't be waiting too long. One of our observing debaters was also thrown out, so maybe we could wait for her as well. Um, am I audible? We could hear that. He still seems to be in Zoom purgatory, but I'll let you know if we get any updates.
uh, that panelist seems to be on some Zoom call now, so I think we'll be starting pretty shortly. Um, so if you know that a member of your team has run out to the bathroom or anything, uh, now might be a time to summon them back. I'm here. J just got in. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're all here too. Do you hear Matt? Yes. Sorry about that. No problem. Can I just check? I know I, ju I literally just checked. Can I, can I just check that both Team Slovenia and Canada are here in their entire... I think you're muted. We can't hear you. Please, I'm unmuted. That's probably a better reason. Excuse me. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, the Online World School's Octo Final, which is uh, taking place technically in Mexico, but is actually taking place in my parents' living room. Uh, you're all very welcome, and we're all very much looking forward to what I'm sure will be an excellent debate. My name is Kiana. I'll be your chair. Uh, I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves, uh, probably in alphabetical order, starting with Bell. Hi, my name is Belle. I'll be paneling this evening. Um, I'm joining you from South Africa. Hi, uh, Benji, uh, also paneling you this uh, to Stephen today, uh, uh, joining you from uh, London by way of Israel. Hi, Mikey Nix. I'm Laura from Romania. Hi. Hi, I'm Matt, joining you from my parents' dining room in Sherborne, England. Uh, thank you all very much for that. Um, the speakers have dropped speaker order in the chat. Um, if you can't access that currently, Matt, we'll get it to you later. Um, if speakers could indicate their preferences for POIs at the beginning of their speech or at the beginning of their first speaker speech, that would be ideal. And if the other team could take account of what the other team's preferences are, that would be even more uh, ideal. Um, and if there are no further questions, I welcome the first speaker from Team Proposition. Here, here. Um, I hope I'm audible and Team Slovenia prefers audible POIs because we cannot see you on these little screens. <clears throat> the real source of evil in our society is, on, is non action. When you're blinding yourself away, witnessing others' lives in danger, and you walk away, that's when you're directly, consensually letting those things happen and perpetuating them. We are very proud to be on the side of the motion, which imposes criminal liability on individuals when they fail to assist a person in danger, when doing so without place themselves serious at risk. But what are we talking about? About criminal liability, we think that, when, that this directly means that in our world, inaction becomes a crime which deserves a certain point of punishment. That's why our model would say that punishment would vary from case to case. It depends on the ability you had to help in the first place. This means the knowledge, the experience you have, and the mental and physical capability. We think that this means from paying a fine to being incarcerated. We don't think it is a radical model. Some countries already have this in place. For example, in Slovenia, you're criminally liable when you don't give a dying person CPR. We think that this is something that should be in place otherwise as well. We think that at the point of which you as an individual think injustice has been done, you are, we are willing to fight you and proving guilt from courts. But what are the examples? What are we talking about? But, you know, this mostly happens in today when we're in examples where you're not reporting a rape from happening because you don't want to expose yourself. Or when someone is having a seizure that directly in front of you, but it would take too much time to call the police. Or when you literally hear domestic abuse and screams for help and you're not willing to call the police when you, there's a car crash and you drive away because you're late for work. What is our stance instead of proposition? We think the society has convinced individuals that the, they can, that the way to achieve happiness is through selfishness to putting themselves first. We think rather it should be about helping others, going out of the way to help someone to be 
to uh, support solidarity. We did our model directly helps that because within a true legislation, states are holding people directly accountable, regardless of who they are, where they come from, within this direct, at the point to which it's literally helping people save lives. We're very happy to import, enforce such a motion. We will have three arguments out of proposition today. Firstly, we we'll talk about how we have a principal duty to help uh, to, to implement this, uh, this model. model. Secondly, and we're going to talk about how we're incentivizing people to help others. And then thirdly, Jana, in second, to we'll talk about how we're um, having more solidarity in our society. Before I go on to the principal duty, in our case, I'll pick the POI. How is the question of serious risk adjudicated? Is it retrospectively by, by the justice system? Or is it what an individual had a reasonable ability to think believe? It's equally when you are holding a doctor accountable for malpractice. It's through evidence, it's through witnesses, it's through the knowledge and the expertise you have uh, available. So firstly, about principal duty. We think that there's certain like, criteria we hold in our society when we're directly holding people accountable and liable for their action. It is when you're directly and either endangering someone else's lives or when you have the ability to help, but you otherwise wouldn't. That's why we're holding doctors malpractice liable. That's why we're also holding liable driver, drunk drivers. We think that in this case scenario that we're talking about today, there's a duty to help people who are putting themselves, uh, who are who are in danger and at risk. We think directly helping them means actually preventing harm from Point. others to help them. We think that there's a duty to help someone else's lives. But secondly, it is, it is especially important at the point of what we're talking about cases where people literally cannot help themselves. Thus, there needs to be some other um, uh, some some other third party being in place. But thirdly, we think that people would mostly want themselves when they when they would find themselves in those positions to help and achieve and gave uh, and have uh, and have um, support and be uh, and help uh, help from others. That's why we think at the point of which you yourself would want to have CPR when you're seizuring on the street or there's a or 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 when there's a car crash and people just drive away. You would want someone to call an ambulance. You yourself should be directly liable for doing that Point. to others as well. But the state can, through legislation, give us duties that we should hold and follow by holding us directly accountable for not following them. But at the point to which we're literally helping save people's lives, it, this is a part of that. That's what we think we have a principal duty to enforce this mechanism. Second argument about how we're incentivizing people to, to help others. There are two layers with which we argue this. Firstly, within it in general, people sometimes want to be selfish. They literally the, there are literally cases when they won't help and get out of the car because it would mean that they would be late for, late for work, and that's why they're not helping others. We get to the point of which we choose to be selfish. We now give you through our model direct incentives to um, uh, selfish reasons to sacrifice your time and go help others. We get in general we're we're tackling those people who are not helping right now. But secondly, we think that there are certain groups of people who are empirically more exposed to danger and risk than others. Maybe like marginalized communities, which don't get political representation or don't have time to be politically active. Or it's people from poor socioeconomic status who cannot afford safe cars or cannot afford healthcare or cannot afford insurances. Or it's people who sometimes have to put themselves at risk just to get by when you already have a heart condition, but you still have to do a huge amounts of labor because you otherwise wouldn't get by. We think that people who are otherwise privileged and better off do not care for helping these people. We don't think that they choose and they usually leave them out. Why? Because firstly, there are other thought that it is not their issue, that they just that they, that they just Point. wouldn't that someone else's problem isn't yours. You think that other people should be capable enough to take care of themselves, or it's because you don't want to take on the burden, or you don't want to take on the burden of exposing your own privilege. You don't want to sacrifice your time. We think that we're directly giving those people incentives to care about issues which they otherwise wouldn't be because we're holding them liable for when these uh, uh, for the risks that other people take care. Right? We think that at the point of which you don't want to be liable when you witness a cop kneeling on an African American person's neck, you're more likely to care about police. Um, 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 uh, police law, uh, police law reform, or when you're in India and poor people die from poor from poor, from poor healthcare every day, but they're from a different caste system. That you literally don't care what happens to them. We think that we in an, in a society when there are certain inequalities from people from different backgrounds from different communities, we should give them the ability. We should give them the um, we should give them the opportunity to help. Um, before I go on, I'll take a POI. If I think there was one. If it is immoral to fail to assist someone in need by omission, why do we not have an obligation to donate almost all of our wealth, for instance, to alleviating poverty in the developing world? 
we think that right now people are making a consensual choice by not helping others who are directly risking themselves to be in danger. But secondly, we think what this argument that I'm, uh, this argument that we're, which I'm talking about right now proves is that people are more likely to donate to others at the point to which not doing so would mean that they would be more that there would be more risk that they would be liable for the justices done to them in the first place. Right at the point of which, because more people cannot afford healthcare and they're more likely to um, crash in front of you, and, and you're going to be liable for what happens to them, you're more likely to care about those people, you're more likely to um, help them, you're more likely to find ways to help them. We get on a comparative at the point to which it literally costs you to not care, that, that, that is when you're more most likely to do so. And then importantly, this is di directly addressing people who otherwise don't have the ability to shape their me mentality because they don't think that this is a part of their issue. We think that by having the, the, the legislature um, holding them accountable is, some, is when you're actually achieving change. But then it's especially problematic when we're putting people in the position of race from marginalized communities. Now more people will support social movements. Now more people will consider how they vote when they vote because they know that injustices being done on a wider social scale are part of their issue um, as well. Panel, we think that people cry out for help, someone should answer. And we hear that today that answer is out of proposition. We're very happy to be on the proposition side of this motion. I thank that speaker very much and welcome the first speaker from the opposition. Can everyone hear me? Side Proposition's motion never considered whether in, pr in principle we should consider holding individuals to such a high standard, but their policy focuses on a very strange roundabout way of getting social benefits of having people care about these issues. Not only do they not get those benefits, but it was an unjust policy in and of itself to subject individuals to this standard, and we're going to prove that to you on side opposition. Two main constructive arguments then come from opposition. First, why it's in principle unjust to hold these individuals criminally liable for this. Second of all, why you make the situation far worse. Before that, I just want to to some refutation of side propositions material. We have a couple of problems first with their case from the outset. First of all, they took on a very low burden in this debate that if someone has a seizure, you should call 911, that if you hear domestic abuse, you should call 911, because we suppose in the status quo, most individuals already do this to a great extent, given that the risk is extremely low for them and most reasonable individuals would see if they could help in some way. Their side needed to necessarily defend imposing criminal liability in cases where people otherwise wouldn't have acted to make them act even more to create all the benefits that they want and they never justified that extent. But second of all, they never actually addressed the question of how they determined the severity of the risk, whether it be retrospectively within courts or how an individual person in the moment would judge it. And here's why that's very important, because many individuals can say that I didn't act because in that moment I feared that it would have been a greater risk than afterwards I determined to be. And there's not always eyewitnesses that they try to say in their POI. So a lot of their benefits hinge on the ability to actually hold people to account. And if there's reasons for people being able to get off because it's not determined retrospectively, then they can't collect their benefits. But now to some more specific reputation of their principle. The first kind of bizarre part of their principle is that we as individuals would like to be helped if we are in that scenario. So we should have the state as the best actor to give us those du duties and enforce them. First of all, you can't approximate our preferences and it's not exactly a reciprocal obligation that you're creating on your side. Not everybody will necessarily be in the scenario in the future or be in that scenario with that specific person that would necessitate that obligation or relationship. But second of all, it is not a reason there, there are, their principle was that you will you have a privilege as someone who is benefited from safer cars, better health care, not having to work from these jobs, so you should help them. But the logical, ex logical extension of this point was very bizarre because it would mean anyone who is more privileged should have to sacrifice themselves for the gain of that individual. And through POI, we noted that that wouldn't be just if someone was, for example, higher income in our status quo to donate all of our wealth. Finally, I think their oh, benefit... Man caring about social issues like fixing the safety of cars and better working conditions was a very strange mechanism to get their benefit in an indirect way because there's many dangers in this debate. The danger from individuals drowning, the dangers from domestic abuse. It's unclear given how many issues there are, how people would mobilize in any meaningful way to create political change to address that. So their benefit really falls. Now moving on to the first constructive argument for side opposition about the principle of why it is unjust to hold these individuals criminally liable. The first note is that this is not a criminal action itself. Our bar for when someone should be liable is when you make the world a bad 
a worse place. But in this case, an individual is not doing anything that inflicts a wrong. The world mm -hmm. would exist in the same way whether you were in that scenario or not. What it is is an omission, not doing something that could help someone. And we don't think that people should be liable for a failure to act. Just as we pointed out in a POI, an illustration, by proposition standard, all of us should be liable for not donating mm -hmm. wealth to help the developing world that would meaningfully improve their lives and save their lives um, by, in many circumstances we ha where we have the capacity to. But we don't in that case because we think that individuals are autonomous and don't owe those specific obligations. Um, but second of all, you should, it is only justified to hold individuals liable for omissions where there's a special moral obligation or relationship to that other individual, whereas the higher duty of care where that would be creating negligence. So for example, the relationship between a parent or a child or a corporation making a product. That doesn't happen here because you don't have a relationship to this other individual. Not only did you just happen to be there, anybody else theoretically could have been in the exact mm -hmm. scenario, but you didn't consent to joining into that relationship in the first place, and you have no reciprocal obligation to them either. It is unclear whether in in any meaningful way, you would be benefited down the line either by this individual either. You have no obligation to the specific person and all individuals are separate entities with their own autonomy that do not owe it to themselves to benefit someone else, to be instrumentalized for someone else's gain. But the second part of this principle is that even if there is a wrong committed in theory, you should not be held morally responsible because it is unreasonable burden. Because all humans are hardwired to have a fight or flight response. You cannot control your reflexes. When you see danger, most individuals by human nature have their rationality shut down. They often freeze. And in many cases where individuals have perhaps similar past experiences, that may have triggered similar traumas from the past as well. What is what the implication here is that it is unreasonable for most individuals or anyone mm -hmm. to be expected to triumph over these natural biological instincts to be the hero in this case. But if proposition says, look, you're not putting yourself in serious risk, you should stick your neck on the line and do it. But and the problem is that you can't adjudicate those risks in the moment. Even if a third party or objective actor or from a retrospective position, you would see that there is no a tangible risk to you in acting, being in the situation often clouds the judgment and the risk is often inflated perceptually from that individual's perspective to be far greater. So even also, if you're somehow completely rational, you also lack information as the person in the scenario. There's no way to predict how it might escalate in the future and also risk your life. It is also subjective how you determine what is risk in general versus a severe risk. For many individuals, something that would be to some others not as risky could be subjectively more so. So what is clear, it is unjustified in their world to hold individuals to such a high standard and it's not right to hold them to that. The second argument in this debate then is about the practical impacts, why you make the situation far worse. We think on either side in this house, most reasonable people would call 911 in cases where they like to identify, like seizures, domestic mm -hmm. abuse, and let professionals take over. But their side worsens it in two ways. And I want to note here that different people respond differently. And in both cases, whether they help or they don't help, it will be incredibly dangerous. So first of all, more people are likely to flee on their side of the house. So those individuals who might report or call 911 in the status quo are likely now not to want to get involved whatsoever. Because criminal liability makes the stakes far higher. There's great ambiguity in these cases. There's relatively little information about how great that risk is. And the risk can be determined subjectively actively in the future in ways you could not understand. You don't know how much as an individual you need to do to fulfill that burden of removing criminal liability, whether that person is quickly dying and they need help right now, whether calling 911 is purely enough. So many individuals may decide in this case, it is better to not involve themselves whatsoever, to avoid any association with the event, to avoid even the slight risk of criminal liability if proposition wants their benefits and levies fines and punishment that come with it. This is the most impactful and harmful in proposition's best cases where you are the only one at the scene, where you are the only one who can uniquely help that individual, and no one else will see if you leave or extract yourself from the scenario. This is also harmful later down the line for trials, for example, where you're less likely to have witnesses that come forward for testimonies and evidence because they don't want to implicate themselves with criminal liability for not acting. So in their side of the house, individuals not being involved whatsoever, not taking that first step of calling 911, means you lose those crucial minutes that you could help save a life by a professional. But the second case, for those who do try to get involved, and try to actively assist in the scenario because I don't think calling 911 is enough. Individuals may believe that the criminal liability could be imposed in any cases because it's unclear how much you might need to do, whether that person might die soon. This is bad because civilians are not trained professionally and will do more harm than good. Trying to take it on themselves means like you have instances where many drug
drownings often happen where they're dr joint drownings, where you individually think that you can swim and save this individual, but you don't have the proper training to assess scenario, that the lake might have undercurrents that pull you both under and you don't have the training to deal with that scenario. And it means both lives are lost unnecessarily. It also means like in the cases of their examples, not being properly trained in, for example, first aid equipment or using CPR means that you could seriously mess up that individual's chance for life. In many cases, you have to break their ribs in order to properly give CPR, but individuals don't want to go to that extent because it doesn't feel comfortable or they're not properly trained with the knowledge to do so. So on their side, either way, whether they get involved or not, you have harms and you escalate the situation far beyond just in the status quo when most individuals would reasonably act to call 911 and get professionals involved. Because we better address the situation of danger and in principle do not believe people should be held to such an extent, I'm incredibly proud to oppose. Thank that speaker very much and welcome the second speaker from Proposition. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Your panel, the team of opposition, is taking and not understanding the status quo really well. You see, people are not calling 911 in the status quo. No, they drive by, pass the people who are on the highway, in possibility of dying, or actually lying on the floor dying. Why? Because they are too selfish, because they don't want to stop and be late for work and be late for a possibility of promotion. That is the status quo that they have to engage with. And secondly, you have to realize that people consider themselves selfish, just as, just as the team opposition her, in her first uh, argument, in her principally explained, because they are selfish and because they believe that they are islands, the entities in the world, all by themselves on the market, all by themselves to fight for their own needs. And that is the problem that we want to change, at least in some way, on the side of opposition. I'm going to do two things in my speech. Firstly, three major points of rebuttal and reconstruction, then to my argument that is tackling the change of the narrative that is currently present, the selfish narrative that is currently present in the state of code. So firstly, on our model. So what the first speaker of opposition says is that we do not explain to them how we would actually evaluate if the person was in a harm that was so big that he, for example, or so, so little that he was, for example, unjustly not helping someone else. But we say that is what courts do already in the status quo. When you have a court and when you have a trial, it's obvious that someone is not for example, when he's convicted of murder, they have to say take many things into account. For example, was he coerced? Was he in a harm? Stuff like that. This is what judges do, and this is what we will do in our model as well. So this means that, for example, if you are in such a shock that you couldn't move, it's obviously that you won't get uh, imprisonment just because you didn't help someone, but you will get a fine because we believe in principle that you still was guilty for that. On the other hand, if we believe that, as she said, in many cases, people actually are guilty for doing so because they're selfish and go on not caring for the others. So on that clarification of the first point. Now, secondly, on the principal argument they bring to us. Here they have three major points. Firstly, and three major assumptions, actually. F uh, firstly, they say, and assume that very much, that when you do this action, you do not harm people. And that's the reason why you should not be taken accountable for it. But Madden, uh, dear panel, that is not how this is. Because at the point of which you go past someone who is lying on the street and dying and only has five seconds of life, unless someone gives him the, the breathing right and get him to breathe, you are actually causing his death. At the same time, if you do not report your neighbor that is beating his wife to death, and you don't call 911, you're guilty for that. There is great harm that we take, take into account. This assumption doesn't hold first part of the principle, doesn't hold. Secondly, they talk about um, how you don't have any higher duty to care of the other people. We believe that this is extremely counter the morality that we have in the status quo. If I just ask you to imagine a child drowning in a pond, let's say, having no ability 
to get out of there, but you have the ability to jump in and get him out. Do you personally believe that your morality tells you that you should help him? I believe it does, because in the morality that we in the status quo and the society broadly have is that you do help a person that is in such a position. However, what we are is blinded by the fact that we are like the opposition believing that we do not have to take care of the someone who is dying uh, on the street. So this also doesn't hold. And thirdly, they also talk about how the majority of people actually isn't rational in these moments. We believe, A, not true. The majority of people is very much able to do things. That's why you have people that actually help some people that fall on the ground, right? But secondly, even if it's not true, we believe that shock can sometimes be surpassed if your morality, the, the way you see the world changes, the way Point. the mother is able to protect her child, even when she is in the shock. And we believe that this, uh, uh, this narrative has to change, which will be my argument. So there are doesn't hold reconstruction I did of our argument does. Now, lastly, about the fact that they told that the people are very likely to flee the scene because, you know, you can get you at great risk because stuff like that. Here we have three responses. First, you have to realize that the majority of action you can do is simply call 911. 911 is not a risky action to do, and therefore it is not risky and you wouldn't be afraid to do it. Secondly, it is also true that the 911 can tell you how to save that Wait. person, which means that you're not, no, thank you, putting at risk the people just because you are for example oh fuck uh you're not putting uh, putting uh, people at risk just uh, can someone put the clock uh, on the the screen because the phone is really going to die okay yeah so because you're not putting the person at risk when they to tell you how to actually make someone be Huh. when you are told in, in what way to actually save a person, right? Because if you are told how to give the breathing, he, this person cannot die, or you are told not to get someone with a broken spine out of the car, you won't do it. So in the end of the day, we have to realize that this is not a great risk to do it. You can do it properly. All these assumptions of theirs do not stand. Therefore, they do, uh, their uh, argument doesn't stand. Before I move on to my argument, the POI. No POI, okay. Then, uh, yeah. You said in your second argument, they won't flee the scene because all they need to do is call 911. But the examples you were talking about are where people are going to die in five seconds and you need to give CPR or do something. Which is it and choose what? I mean, you, you call the 911, 911 tells you go and save that person, give the, him the CPR and you do, okay? Now moving on to my argument. So here I talk about how we are able to change and make the society a society of greater solidarity. So the thesis here is that what the, the, the narrative that we currently have, which is the non-action, the fact that you don't help someone, is entirely okay, is making the society a lack of solidarity that we should have. And we can change that with our model. So what is this narrative that we are living in. It is A, that your needs always surpass the needs of other people. This means, for example, that just the fact that you can get a tiny, tiny scratch means that you do not have to help someone else, right? This is the narrative that we are told through the, the, through the media, through upbringing and stuff like that. Secondly, that always the needs of others are, do not concern you. Actually, something that the first speaker in the opposition explained to you very well because she believes in it. Why? Because the media, the upbringing made her to believe so. But why is this narrative problematic? For two reasons. Firstly, because it creates an extremely toxic environment that we in the side of opposition don't like. The environment when a grandma with heavy bags cannot get help from someone else because it is engraved in them that they do not have to care about her needs and that simply if they will have an aching arm from carrying the bags, they should not so do, do so. But secondly, because it also perpetuates the belief that we shouldn't help the poor, right? That you do not have to vote for a president that would get higher taxation to you, that you don't have to give to the charity just because you will get a little bit of harm, right? We believe this is very problematic. But how do we change this on the side of opposition? Three mechanisms. Firstly, we will, the point when you make something criminalized, this changes the perception of the people. Simply the fact that the drugs are illegal makes the people believe that the drugs are bad, at least the majority of people. And at the point of which you believe that not helping someone in certain cases is not right, it is very likely that you will change the way you think in the way that you will believe that it is actually very well to help the people in general. But secondly, we will get people that would not comply with these ideas into prison, which means that they will go through the rehabilitation problems or, or fines, whatever, right? Rehabilitation programs, they will have psycholo psychological 
uh, like support and stuff like that. And people will actually tell them that what they did was wrong, which means that they could change this way. But thirdly, the narrative that is happening in the media would also change because the media would now not talk about the people not helping someone with simply, okay, he was just helping for some nothing really horrible, but they will actually make great statements. This is important for two reasons. A, because we have, a, we, not, we do not say that it will happen like now, but we at least have in the future the possibility of this narrative changing, the possibility of children growing up with the idea that solidarity is important, having more support for the poor people, having more support um, for help in general. Proud to propose. I thank that speaker very much, and I welcome the second speaker from the opposite. Can everyone hear me? Great. When it was convenient for them, Proposition wanted us to believe that this would be a policy that would fundamentally reshape society, that no longer would people act as atomic, selfish individuals, but rather they would fundamentally be shifted by prison re-education programs into being less selfish individuals. But at any point when we objected to their policy, the simple response was that all this is is a legal obligation to call 911, and maybe if you have some degree of training, the person on the phone might walk you through how to give CPR. Prop needs to choose one of these two things, because either the status quo changed substantially in ways that fundamentally re-alter our society, and we believe that omissions are morally significant, or we believe that there is very limited efficacy to their policy. So two questions I'll ask. First of all, is this a just expectation? And second of all, how does the world look substantially different from the status quo? I'll deal with the contradictions on Prop when it comes to that. But the first thing I want to identify is where the responses from proposition miss the mark of the actual point of the arguments that Angela was bringing. So I'll start with the principled argumentation. Their substantive response to the principle is, first of all, that the courts can magically solve for the problem. And the main idea that they say is that if someone was in shock in the moment, for instance, they won't be held culpable. But this kind of offense is not like a murder. You can't have detailed psychological evaluations of a person. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these offenses every year. This is more akin to a speeding ticket than it is to a murder investigation. And similar to how when someone is speeding, we don't care about whether or not they were looking at their speedometer and knew whether they were speeding. It is highly likely that for them to be able to implement that we cannot be having long trials where we get into the mental state of everyone who failed to save someone in the river or failed to slow down and stop someone on the road. What that means is that these have to be offenses that don't care about culpability in any substantial way. The second thing I want to observe is that even if courts in some limited circumstances could care about culpability, so for instance, if someone completely froze and had a panic attack, that does not deal with the actual point of the argument. The point of the argument was that the flight or fight response is inherent to all circumstances like this. That the reason why someone seems selfish by fleeing is not always pure selfishness, but rather a frozen reaction. That these are about our reflexes, our most fundamental psychological conditions that are not in any meaningful way controlled by us. There are reflexes that are controlled by sources outside, by chemicals in our brain. And similar to how the criminal justice system recognizes that forces like duress, for instance, or different psychological factors ought to influence the way in which we determine culpability, we'd say the fact that in almost all of these cases, people are witnessing trauma for the first time in their life. These are people who've never witnessed anything like this, who don't know what to do. And it is not selfish for them to have a fight or flight response. That means that the decision making the prof is talking about is never a culpable one. This deals with the second part of their principle, which is they say, no, thank you, that there's an active wrong that's being done because you are making an active choice to turn away. This is only the case if they have already proven that you have a significant moral obligation to that person, because if you have no moral obligation to them, then turning away does not matter. So why then is it the case that you have no moral obligations to these people? If you get past the language and rhetoric from their side, the extent of their argumentation is that people ought not be selfish for we're not really sure precisely why, because the analysis that we gave to you in the principle is that you have no significant moral relationship with these people. You do not consent to having a random moral relationship when you walk by someone in the street. Mm -hmm. If their analysis is true, panel, whenever you walk by someone, you now develop a new and unique moral relationship that is equivalent in nature to your moral relationship with the state, because your moral relationship with that person can cause you to be imprisoned. We suggest that that would be implausible on face. But the second thing to know is that their only response on this is that there is reciprocity. Because if you save a person who's dr drowning in a river, then 10 years down the line, someone else might do it for you. But this is not actual reciprocity for two reasons. First of all, these are inherently rare cases. 1% of the population gets involved in these at any given time. There's no reasonable expectation of reciprocity. But second, 
If there is, it will be from someone else who has no significant moral relationship with you, not from the same person. No reciprocity in that case. And note, they care about individual moral obligations. This becomes tense on a principle level if they say, well, someone else will benefit you. This concedes that individual moral relationships are less important than your relationship to society overall and to the state. And if that is true, then presumably the state should not coerce you in these deeply harmful ways. What did Angela give to you as to why there was no moral failing? First of all, she characterized why this is similar to other reasonable circumstances under which we deem justice to occur. So for instance, we say that negligence is possible when you are a company that gives a product to a consumer and deceives them. That is an act. We say that in some circumstances, you are negligent even by omission if you're a parent who mistreats their child, who fails to do the important things. But that is because a parent wills a child into existence uh, by having them, and because that child never consented into that relationship. People are substantially different than the parent-child relationship or the corporation-company relationship, and no moral relationship is developed by the interactions that Prop talks about. And here I want to know, thank you, point something out about the strategy of this round. For Prop to win, they have to prove both that this is a just action and and, and also on some level that it has any substantial benefit, or else it's just the status quo if we can prove that people act in relatively just ways already. But for us, to win, all we have to do is to prove, A, this will lead to devastating effects, even if it might in theory be principally justified, or we can prove that it's principally unjustified. If you believe either of these things from our side, then none of the prop case can stand. On to the practical content, but before that, I'll take the point. Look, none of these of examples that you use for your principle are the circumstances of which we are talking about. We are talking about different circumstances. So the fact that you compare them with someone helping with some sort of help for the children that are mistreated by, by parents is not applicable to this okay. debate at all. It is applicable because it's a thought experiment. It's an illustration. What it serves to point out is that while there might be a moral relationship in the case of a parent, child, or other morally significant actions, that a stranger on the street does not have that same level of moral relationship. Very odd POI. On the second question then of what will happen that is different from the status quo. Now, a couple of things happen under this. Um, The first thing is that they have two broad perceptual arguments that I just want to get out of the way first. The first is that we care more about the poor because if cars are better, for instance, then presumably we'll be in less of these circumstances. A, in order for this mechanism to work, that must concede. So there's a tension basically, because in order for their mechanism to work, they're basically saying people will not want to enter into these circumstances. So they will care more about the poor. So they have less to do to assist the poor in the future. Their second practical argument is that norms will change such that people are no longer selfish. But in order for their first practical argument to work, we have to believe that people will not want to engage in these circumstances and be relatively selfish. And that is why there will be an incentive for them to help the poor more directly. So both these things can't be true at once, but I'll deal with them both individually. Um, On the first question, they say that people are too selfish and social norms will follow. And I want to just briefly address the question in this round of whether or not people are good or bad in the status quo, which appears to be the black and white that Prop wants to follow us into. I don't think either team in this debate particularly knows whether it's true that people broadly do call 911 or broadly don't call 911. But the more important thing to note is that in most cases, there will be some individuals who are willing to do the right thing. And the individuals who do the right thing are those who are going to be most engaged in the process, most willing to have effective training to help the, to help people who are suffering. So tacking on 30 other individuals who are only helping to fulfill a legal moral obligation probably means those people will not be trained because all they're trying to do is erase their sins and avoid criminal culpability. That led to one of two things, and we noted these were distinct cases. First of all, that people, and I'll note this is really important, people who would have otherwise called 911 in their world because it's the baseline decent thing you can do will now fail to call 911 because they're worried that if they identify themselves to 911 and they fail to do anything else because they needed to flee, now those individuals will face punishment. They won't testify in trial. So fewer of these murders and rapes get solved. And crucially, we don't even get a baseline level of reporting to 911 because people don't want anything to do with it. That deals with their best case scenario where just two people alone in the woods, and that beats the claim. On the second argument, we were just able to prove that even if people could respond in the useful practical way that they do, it's insufficient on the ultimate level. Most people don't have the training. Ultimately, this was unjustified, didn't work, and was not sufficiently different from the status quo. So for those reasons, we oppose. I thank that speaker very much and welcome the third speaker from the proposition team. I hope I'm audible in just a second, please. So if I organize. Hello, 
we might be EFL and ESL speakers, but we think our case was pretty clear. And you should not let the side of opposition straw man it and get away with a weak win in this debate. That's a few points in this speech. Firstly, some clarifications on a model. Secondly, on the principle. Thirdly, on practical. So what we got from opposition mostly is a lot of challenging on how our model is going to work, how efficient actually our model is, and yada yada. Two things we have to clarify here. Firstly, we think it's very intuitive how our model actually works at a point where we tell you that you get to the cases that we talk about where people didn't help other people in cases of danger, and then you put them in front of a court and then you know prosecute them, get all of the things we want to talk about. The only response here is, oh, but you know, we won't really have murder trials, so we can't really elaborate all of the things. Well, one, we think you don't have to have murder trials to take into account circumstances like whether the person in the case was in shock because obviously 911 responders already see that. However, secondly, we don't really see why they disagree with this point because at the best it mitigates our impacts, but it never really deals with why we shouldn't do this policy in the first place. This is why we don't know why it continues to challenging, and we actually think they have quite some balls to come up here and tell us that we are not doing enough in the status quo, where their solution is literally the status quo which is the bad situation we are debating about. If they want to talk about solutions, then bring solutions, not only attack the things that don't actually minimize. But more about this when I come to practicalities, where I show it's better off on our side of the house. So firstly, then, to first clash about the principle. Look, we think this clash is actually very important in this debate, because we think that a state, when it has a principle justification to do something, it should do that regardless of the consequences. For example, prosecuting malpractice might disadvantage doctors from doing certain risky surgeries, but we still prosecute against it because we don't want to do those things because we think that the harm to individuals is way too big. So what do we actually tell you when it comes to principle? First of all, that those people are able to prevent harm, are able to prevent from world being worse on, their, on our side of the house. Why is this so? Because when you save someone's life, they are not dead, meaning that we are able to prevent a bad situation, similarly as prosecution of malpractice. Secondly, because people in those situations can't actually help themselves. And lastly, because we think that everyone in this same situation would want the help from others. So what is the engagement we get from opposition on the principal level? First criteria they give to us is that world must be made a worse place if some action or inaction is done in order for any side to win the principle. I think that at the point when you leave a person to die, it's obviously a world's world on the side of opposition. That's why we are justified to right. I know that conveniently second op dropped this criteria, but it doesn't make it disappear from the debate. Secondly, we are telling you, they tell us that when you have higher duties of care, this is the only situation when you're actually able to engage with those things. But their panel, I don't think you need a high duty of care to actually save someone from dying in order to prevent those things. But second of all, by their own logic that you should only care about the victims when they are high care or high duty victims, it means that murder is okay as long as you murder strangers. I don't know what that, this logic is doing in this debate. It's totally irrelevant. It proves nothing and it's actually harmful for their side Point. because I don't think people should get away with crime just because they don't know the victim in question. Thirdly, they tell us we impose an unreasonable burden because there is a flight and risk policy. This is a tension in that case because they tell us that most of the people either way already report those things, right? So apparently this is not such a big deal in status quo. We think that in most cases people are able to overcome this, are able to happen. Second of all, we are willing to trade it off on the principal level. Why is this so? Because harm to the people who are dying because no one helps them is greater than the harm to the people who will now be fined or incarcerated for a year on their side of the house. This is why it's like proposition wins on the principal level, and this is why we already win this debate. Hopefully, third off, will be more charitable when engaging. Secondly, on the practicalities of this model. So first of all, let's clear what do people actually have to do on our side of the house in order to meet our too high burden of helping other people. We think that the first step is for people actually calling 911 in those situations. Why is this enough of a burden for us? Because when you call 911, they tell you what you should do in this situation in order to help those people the best. The first question you have when you call 911 is, do you know CPR? Can you bring someone back? Do you know, is, was the person's step, do not pull the knife out in order to bleed out? 
We think that those are all practical benefits which are happening on our side. They straw manning this position of ours. However, two arguments we give you. Firstly, three arguments. Firstly, that selfish people are more likely to help because they don't want to be prosecuted in the status quo. No, this is a separate stakeholder than majority of society because we don't think everyone is selfish. So that most of the negation already falls out of the window when they try to bundle everyone together talking about how everyone is selfish and how we have to pick a lane. We did, it's called nuance, engage with it. However, we tell you that selfish people are more likely to actually do those things because they want to actually not be prosecuted, never engage from opposition. And second, the only engagement which we get here, right, is the constructive point of people will flee the crime scenes and never report things. But one, we think this is minority of cases because we don't see this happening in status quo because it's a bigger crime to not commit, to not report, uh, to not be a witness, to obstruct justice than it is to report that you could have helped but not didn't in the status quo. We think that people are able to do this rational trade-off and are more likely to take the lower punishment, which is actually reporting things. And secondly, it's easier to help that person than to go to the trial in the first place. So yeah, we don't know what they're engaging here. Secondly, we are telling you that we help them marginalize better. Now, here they straw man their argument, our argument, right? Because Emma doesn't only talk about how we are able to get more political support for marginalized people, Point. even though we do, I will take in a second, because we actually help people to build solidarity, but it's also the fact that black people are less likely to get help when they get in a car crash, because white people don't care, and no one is forcing them to care in the status quo. I will take a point now. Where does proposition draw the line about where omissions to strangers are morally significant? Because if you don't believe that wealth donation is a moral necessity, okay, thank you. but I you do believe point. that you must have first the person all, in front of you, where is the difference? All, please give me my time back. First of all, we are already telling you in the status quo, we are fine with giving those implementations in those cases because it's saving someone's life. We think that this is different than giving away your wealth in order to marginally improve the situation of people in developing countries. Because the immediate impact of your action that we are talking about is saving someone's life, but even if we take them at their best, fine, let's give wealth away to people in Africa. It doesn't deal with our case in any way. However, secondly, why are we more likely to have them marginalized than on our side of the house? Because you're actually forced to help them in the status quo because you are the one who is legally responsible for it. We think that black people are not getting help in status quo because people are selfish and because people don't want to help and can get away with it. On our side of the house, you have an enforcement mechanism how to do this. Lastly, on the narrative point that Yana brings out and they never engage with because, you know, it's a contradiction somehow. We tell you that in general, society perceives now differently those actions because they are criminalized, meaning that we actually get less people who are acting like this in the long run. So we tell you that on the short run, we save more people because people are able to have them, because most people have CPR training, because you have to do a first aid kit when you apply for a driver's license in Europe. We are telling you that we have more people in the short term, we improve the society in the long term, we win on principle, stick with us, don't let them get away. I thank that speaker very much and welcome the third speaker from the opposition team. Sorry about that. Um, can everyone hear me? Just a moment. Let's be clear on burdens here. Proposition had to prove two things and both things if they want to win this debate. One, that we have a principal obligation to others. And two, that their mechanism is a way in which to fulfill that principal obligation to others. We just needed to disprove one, either that this was an unfair restriction on people's liberty and autonomy, or secondly, that even if we conceded their principal parameter, this would do more harm to the people that they said they have a principal obligation to. The third proposition speaker tries to make retribution an independent path to victory by saying punishing these people is a good in itself. Why? If condemning a criminal leads to worse outcomes for their potential victims, then clearly that condemnation isn't a good in itself. The implication here is simple. Either we beat them on the principle or we beat them on their pragmatic claims, but either one is enough to cast a ballot for side opposition. The second thing I want to clarify at the top of this speech is the supposed tension in our case. The third proposition speaker says we undercut our claim when we say that people call 911 anyway. No, we don't. We said that in many cases, people will call 911. 
In cases where they wouldn't, it is unjustified to impose criminal liability upon them. And crucially, we think it is morally praiseworthy to help a person. We don't think it is morally obligatory, and we certainly don't think you are negligent for failing to do so. That was the distinction between the two sides, and that was the bar that proposition never met. I'm going to talk about two broad things in the speech. Firstly, the principle in this debate, and second, on whether they actually help other people. So firstly, on the principle. And there are two questions under this principle. Proving either of them was sufficient for opposition. One, whether this is a moral wrong. If it's not, we shouldn't prosecute it. And B, even if it was a moral wrong, are people sufficiently morally responsible for that wrong for it to qualify as a criminal act? To the first question, is this a moral wrong? The starting point to our principle, never meaningfully engaged with, given at the top of opposition, is that we are all separate, autonomous, and dignified persons entitled to our liberty. Proposition wouldn't say that we have to donate all our wealth to save other people in the developing world. Why? Because we are individuals entitled to our freedom and our conception of the good life. We are not born, no thank you, to be the slaves of others. We never become consent to be pawns that are socially that are social battering grounds to make other people better off. And to the extent that we do not cause a net harm in the world by causing suffering, merely being merely being omitting to improve that suffering or alleviate it should not qualify as a moral wrong. The relevant question here is this, is there a sufficient special positive obligation to override our freedom and bind us to others? Oh, sir. Like in the way, no thank you, that a parent might have a duty to prevent a child from drowning in the bathtub. And our answer was no, this didn't meet the bar. What were the two justifications, which were really one justification, but I'll I'll turn them into two so I can respond to more things from from their case that we get as to why this is a positive obligation. The first thing they tell you is that you would have wanted somebody else to do this for you. I guess the implicit logic of the proposition, no thank you, is that we benefit from each other in many ways and therefore that creates reciprocal obligations. This is probably the best light in which we can consider the the proposition case. The first thing we point out is that associative, no thank you, positive obligations cannot exist without meaningful consent. And raw benefit or utility from others are an insufficient condition to make us the slaves and make us bound to other people. And here's Nozick's thought experiment here. Let's say everyone contributed to a collective radio system that I could listen to, right? Angela told jokes to us in the community. Max taught us about politics. I benefit from this a lot. I might enjoy myself every day when listening to them. That doesn't mean that I then have a duty to, I don't know, teach people about whatever, maybe I can't teach people about anything, but it doesn't mean that I have a duty to contribute to other people just because I've benefited from them in this way. And the implication is simple. Society cannot just demand anything of us under the justification that we benefited you in some way. The question is whether there's an asymmetry in the degree to which we benefit. And that leads me to my second response on reciprocity. We told you no thank you that reciprocity was missing here. The underlying logic of the proposition is this is justified because you're doing this for someone, but they're also gonna do it for you. The first thing we point out is you are forced to put yourself at risk and to sacrifice your time with no likelihood that anybody else will help you out. And here's where I want to give a thought experiment. Slavery is bad, and we wouldn't put 10 people to work for the rest of society, Mm -hmm. even if, no thank you, those 10 people benefit in some way from the rest of society. And the reason is simple. Even if those 10 people benefit, they are giving in more than they are getting out. And that amounts to material theft. Similarly, This policy amounts to a theft of our freedom and of our dignity when we are forced, no thank you, to give in more than we are getting out from other people. The implicit justification of a state is that we benefit from it and we would have consented to it. That no demand it makes of us exceeds what we get out from it. Our case was that there is an imbalance here, that we are forced to be the slaves of others without meaningful return on what we are forced to give in. And that is why, no thank you, their policy was unjustified. The next justification they have is, well, it's fair because everyone has to do it. Two responses. One, it doesn't make it fair. You can mandate that all of us work 24-7 for a communist regime in order to increase net welfare for other people. The problem is, even if it is applied equally as an obligation, it is an unfair restriction of our freedom because individual rights belong to us as people. There are some things you cannot do to us as each individual, not necessarily as a collective. Eli. Response to no thank you. Their policy, even if on surface equal, manifests itself as unfair instrumentalization. Because some people will arbitrarily be found in these cases where they have to help other people out. And some people will never get this benefit back. The relevant question becomes, why me? If everyone is responsible for what we fail to do and suffering that we fail to alleviate, why am I the unlucky person on the scene who is then held morally responsible? This is not a moral wrong. That eliminates the prop push. The second thing under this theme is, even if it is a moral wrong, is there moral responsibility? And we pointed out that this is irrelevant. If a child commits a crime, or if there's an excuse for duress, or if there's an insanity plea, Even if somebody committed a crime, 
we still care about whether you are morally responsible for that crime because each individual has the right to be evaluated sure. fairly as a moral and autonomous individual. Our case was not that there are extenuating circumstances and hey, the court you are in shock. No, thank you. Our case was, this is not an extenuating circumstance. It is the extenuating circumstance. Everyone is in shock and trauma when seeing somebody else dying. Everybody cannot properly assess the subjective metric of how much risk they are forced to put in. And therefore, you know if they're more wrong, they're not morally responsible for it. Before getting on to the second and less important question of whether this helps others, I'll take your POI. Go ahead. If it is true that everyone is in shock when people are in such situations, why is it then possible that some people actually help others when they are um, harmed? Two reasons. If One, this is a structural fact. Shock, it is justified in those cases. Secondly, because your criminal liability is part of the thing that imposes the shock when it makes people more stressed out because they have to consider various factors like whether this is sufficient risk or to, to, to absolve them of the crime. So on whether this helps others. The first bizarre push is, well, we increase people not to be selfish. One, we pointed out the mitigation. In most cases, people will help others. Why? It is very difficult to avoid our visceral empathetic response to others' suffering. And that is why in most cases, there will be a 911 phone call. Even if people are selfish, there's an overriding empathy that is a natural human instinct when you see another person losing their life, which is what we value the most. But there are two exclusive harms for them. One, that people will flee. And here's the relevant thing. People will not know whether calling 911 is enough. Why? Because it's not like there's going to be a list of 10 criteria of what is justified or unjustified in this policy. Realistically, this will develop through case law and precedent, where we figure out what is reasonable risk, where we figure out what is a reasonable demand to make of a person. People will not be able to assess that. They say just call 911 and they'll teach you how to give CPR. You can't teach someone how to give CPR in two minutes, guys. Like, that's unrealistic. Second, we told you people will assist when they can't. CPR can, let, can risk breaking other people's ribs. And when you cannot swim, you might risk both of you drowning. There was no response to that. Then on their bizarre claim that now people will vote for welfare policies. The first thing is this is a huge logical leap. Like it doesn't make you want to give up your tax dollars just because other people, just because you might see some people saving other people in society. There's a huge disconnect between these two narratives, especially given that theirs is very rare. Second, this is not a justification for imposing this duty as a pathway to other duties. You might make me more empathetic by forcing me to watch videos of people dying all day so that I will donate my taxpayer money to welfare. Still not a justification imposition of forcing me to do that. So clearly, even if they get that benefit of welfare or whatever in the long run, this is an unfair burden to place on people. On all those grounds, I'm very happy to oppose. I thank that speaker very much and welcome the opposition reply. Can everyone hear me? In this debate, team proposition's own language reveals why it's that opposition won. Because they continually say helping other vigils is the selfless thing to do. And we agree precisely with this frame, that it is an altruistic thing to do, but not a morally obligatory one. That on their side of the house, that it was unjustified to hold someone criminally liable for something that they did not do, but that would have been merely beneficial to do. All of the ways they tried to attack our principle in this debate was to say that victims matter more. But that was dependent on proving that this actually would benefit that victim. And we said in both cases that it wouldn't, even if you tried to intervene and even when you didn't. Two themes in this debate then. First, on the principle, whether it is justified. Second, does this do more harm than good? So first, on the principle justification. Now, we told you from the beginning of side opposition that you should not be held liable for this omission because in that, it would be an unreasonable standard to hold individuals to. Clearly, we should not be all in this room held criminally liable for not donating majority of our wealth to the developing world, even if it could prevent deaths and meaningfully change another person's life because we are all independent entities that we don't owe other individuals anything, that we should not be instrumentalized for their gain, that there was no special moral obligation or relationship. But here we took proposition at their best. They said, look, there is some special relationship because you benefit from privilege in that state, from the ability to have a safer car, to not have to work such a dangerous job. But that's a reason for why the state has an extra obligation to these individuals, because those are state failures, not individualists themselves failing other individuals. They are not culpable in any way for all of these problems. And what if it was two disprivileged individuals in the same circumstance? Their logic was flawed and did not apply precisely to the people they wanted to protect. What was clear is that individuals never consented to this relationship and there was no reciprocity either, so it is unjustified to hold them to such an extent. But even if individuals wanted to help, in many cases natural biological instincts hold them back from jumping into the scene and they lack information about the potential risk. And here note, it was not a tension for us to say some people still call 911 because some people respond to shock differently. Some people can override that and be the hero in this case 
case and call 911. But not everyone can. And it was unjustified for them to punish those who were unable to do so. They needed to talk about why those who wouldn't have done anything should be held liable for that. And they were never able to give a justification. Individuals are not a tool for the state, even if it is beneficial for that state. And it was wrong to do that. But the second theme in this debate then was about whether you create more harm or good. And in this theme, there was a clear problem solution mismatch from side opposite proposition. They stressed the urgency of these cases. Someone is dying in five seconds. They need CPR. Someone is getting beat in the room next to you. And it is a crippling issue of societal wide self interest that we need to combat. What was their solution in this debate then? To call the police. They tried to refute all of our examples by saying people won't flee because all you need to do is call the police. But that clearly doesn't even solve the very problem that they identified, where you needed more assistance, where if you didn't give that additional assistance, that person would die and you would be held criminally liable for not acting. In many cases, we said this policy was uncomparative because some individuals would probably have called the police in either way. But the change in this debate was crucial because criminal liability that is sufficiently scary enough to force selfish people to stick their neck out on the line will probably lead people to do very bad things. In two cases, first of all, running away from the scene in the first place, they can never prove why people would want to stay and take on this burden. Even if you say in theory, all you have to do is call the police, the criminal liability and the threat of the punishment that they are imposing is so great it is unclear to individuals to what degree their obligations exist. So that ambiguity means it is safer for them to completely dissociate. And here they never refuted also the other part of this argument, which is that any witnesses involved are unlikely to want to ever provide testimony for their benefits of the court providing evidence of shock and whether there was risk because they don't want to implicate themselves with that liability. So on their side of the house, this action or this wrong is probably going to happen on, their wife, on either side, but they can't actually get justice for any of those individual victims at the point when nobody wants to get involved to talk about it. But second, even if they do get involved, civilians are bad actors, especially when acting under stress. That joint drownings are very common because people are not trained and they think they can do more than they can. And that even in their best case, they don't even get their benefits of helping victims. In all cases, this was morally unjust and bankrupt and it caused more harm than good. Please vote inside opposition. I thank that speaker very much. And to close out the debate, call on the opposition reply speaker. The main problem sort of opposition today, is ha today has is that, the that there's the fact that there are some general rules we all follow through the society all the time, even when we have to make certain trade-offs ourselves because we don't want to hurt others. It's exactly the reason why we're all debating through computer screens, ri screens right now, because if we wouldn't socially distance, some other people, members of society would be much more harmed that we are just for trading off our time and our uh, ability to be enjoying Mexico right now. Two reasons why we have proven this debate. Firstly, about how we've proven to you there is a moral accountability when it comes to this issue. And secondly, why people are going to likely to be helping others. So firstly, we gave you an argument in first. We talked about how we have duty to help others at the point of which you're, first of all, not in, because you're not endangering others' lives, because even at the point of which you're having people who are unable to help themselves and they're at risk at dying. And secondly, because we did it people who would be the found themselves in the same position would want the same behavior to be uh, to, from others as well. Why hasn't their responses disproved this claim? Firstly, they talked about reciprocity. We at the point of which state gives you duties you that, you that you follow, you, so you fulfill those duties because you realize that there are other members of society will have to fulfill those duties themselves. Is the argument I gave you in first, this reciprocity point does not dispute it. Secondly, they talked about more relationships, relationships, right? But exactly, we have constantly followed protocols and laws, even though at the point of which we harm others is going to be equal punishable if we harm our mother or we harm a stranger. Why? Because endangering some pe people's lives is going to be equally harmful to others. It's exactly why we're social distancing right now. It's why we vaccinate other people. It's why we get uh, fines for speeding. It's because directly um, putting others in danger doesn't mean that you have to have some special moral relationship with them. This hasn't disproven this argument um, that we gave you in first and have been constantly rebuilding in second and third. But second question is debate, right? But we talked about why people are actually going to help others more. The one response we get inside of opposition today in three different versions is how people were likely to flee because they don't want to be morally culpable for these things. And thus, they were, they were likely to like respond in a way which wouldn't give them the, the culpability in the first place. Note that this 
whole argument hinges on the premise that they're actually the only witness, those, them, uh, those proving this culpability is likely to be zero. So the, the, the fact is that they have minimum p impact on their side. But secondly, this is analysis that exactly proves to you the argument we gave you. We're talking about the point to which people are going to have to be morally culpable and like criminally culpable for not helping others. It's exactly the incentive why they're more likely to take the trade off that they otherwise wouldn't. It's exactly why they will be like, they're likely to be late for work and stop at the point where there's a car crash and call 911, help give some CPR because they have to be, um, because otherwise they will be, they will be, um, costs on their lives as well. And note, why right? don't I then about the examples which are happening here, right? I don't think, we don't think the people who are in shock aren't going to be able to be assessed to be in shock and thus they're going to be criminally liable. It is, this also isn't about being liable for someone dying. It's literally doing your best, helping others' lives and the, uh, others lives that you otherwise wouldn't. It's calling 911 and then giving, having been given the instructions what to do next because people essentially realize that you are unable to have all the expertise and all the knowledge. This is actually the cases we were talking about in this debate. But secondly, right, why are we able to help people better in general in our side of the house? Firstly, again, the argument we gave you in first where we talk about how people have no better incentives when they're selfish, about why we give them selfish incentives to help others in the first place. But secondly, we talked about, and this was the engagement we gave in one minute of the third opposition speech, right, how there are certain groups of people who are a lot likely, who are more likely to be at risk because of the socioeconomic status or the, the difficulties they face in the, the society at the point of which you're more likely to find yourself in cases when you might have to help someone because they are exposed to more risk and more danger you're more likely to care about those individuals when you make other choices when you when you when you care about calling out injustices that have been done to them when you care about who you vote and why you vote for and you care about you're more able to care about these groups you're more likely to care about these groups in the long term because we're actually helping people in the society because we're actually fulfilling the principle of moral accountability that we, that we already live by we're so happy to be outside of proposition today i thank that speaker very much and all speakers for an excellent debate uh, we're going to go and deliberate um and then we will come back uh, hopefully in not too long an amount of time and give you the result and justification so we will see you then good luck great i will move the judges now to or actually the yeah we're going to need actually the way we're going to do this is we're going to have all the debaters leave if everyone in the from the debate can please leave we're gonna have the judges stay in this room and then once after the deliberation then we'll be able to move everyone into the breakout rooms um so team thank Canada, you Canada for the debate and the good. Good. thanks so much good round guys uh, i will monitor to make sure everyone leaves and if not i'll just kick them out of the call Sorry, you said we should wait in the main room? Yeah, yes, please. Sorry about the technical difficulties, year friends. After Turns year, out streaming the world's around cool debating championship the gathers the best debaters from around the globe. This year's pandemic made that impossible, so we took it online. In this style of debate, there are two teams. The proposition team, which is in favor of the motion, and the opposition team, which is against it. Each side features three speakers giving four speeches. The first two speakers generally present constructive argumentation. The third primarily focuses on refutation while the reply speaker summarizes the debate. For the prepared rounds, teams research the motions for weeks in advance. For the impromptu rounds, teams have only one hour to prepare after being told the motion.